yeah. I love my HBCU. Uh. And boy, boy, I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah. I love my HBCU. Yeah. And man, yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man, I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the HCCU Sports Lab to see if my team wanna lose. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, keep tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. They compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna lose. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir, and pay attention. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Mike is literally in the air on assignment as he's getting it done. Can't wait to get his back because I wanted to talk to him a little bit about lacrosse while mm. all these new programs, Virginia State out there. I want to get his spin on it because part of the stuff that he's doing is not uh, just um, – traversing the country in terms of traditional work, if you may have it, but actually working in terms of his sons that are playing lacrosse. So a um, lot of talk and discussion of what's going on in the lacrosse world that I'm sure a lot of the listeners will be interested. And since again, with Virginia State announcing that they're adding men's and women's lacrosse in addition to women's soccer and a year from that, men's soccer at the Division II level, I think it's a perfect time to kind of have that conversation. But with that said, welcome to episode 255 of Inside the HBCU Sports Lab radio show and podcast. The show that's covering the sporting HBCU dash, all things HBCU sports, from institutions large and small. From the NEIA to the NCAA, we share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture and HBCU athletics aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs in the business of HBCU sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, along with my co-host, Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, filming from our home studios and sending a signal live to our Case Wage 230 AM studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. Today's episode of Inside HBCU Sports Lab is sponsored by THC Agency, LLC. THC Agency is a company that provides sporting and educational consulting and data analytics. A lot going on in the spring, as you would have it. So we can go in multiple directions. Uh, but before we do that, let me just say, how you doing, Charles? Doing well, Doc. Doing well. You got an opportunity to kind of catch up on a little bit of baseball this weekend, catch up on all the comings and goings of, of HBCU News. Uh, it's never a dull moment in HBCU News. So we, we got to get to it. It's going to be some fun stuff. <laughs> I would say that's good for us. That's good for us. I like <laughs> yes, the moments. Makes the show interesting. I'm gonna shift right back to you since you got it going on. What direction do you want to start off the show today? What's well, start, in your mind? Let's start off with a, the hot news that kind of broke yesterday. As uh, ex Auburn quarterback uh, Demetrius Davis, uh, he is going to be leaving Auburn and he will be committing to Alabama State. So uh, for a lot of us, especially here in the Houston area, we know about the exploits of Matris uh, uh, from his time at North Shore, leading him to uh, back-to-back state titles. Uh, you're talking about a kid who threw for over 13,000 yards, ran for over 3,000 yards. Uh, a lot of people say Kyler Murray 2.0, but when you're talking about a quarterback of this caliber uh, who led uh, North Shore, which is one of the largest schools, uh, Division 6A, uh, here in Texas, coming into the swag. That's a huge sign for uh, Eddie Robinson. I agree with you. That's big. And um, while people are kind of off the radars for football, other than maybe looking at what's going on in spring, um, in terms of a recruiting sign, a signee, transfer, um, big-time, big-time player. Remember, this is a guy that was at all and uh, was – Ready to get some playing time. Even the fans thought he was the big deal. Uh, just had a different coaching come in and preferred taller quarterback. So um, it looks like uh, it was benefit to Alabama State. Prairie View was in the running uh, mm. along with four other institutions. Uh, so that was fascinating just to see how you had a lot of Prairie View people on the edge of their seats. Wow. <laughs> uh, with some excitement seeing if uh, Coach Bubba McDowell could pull it off down there. But it's 
uh, Eddie Robinson at Alabama State. He gets it done. And as I was saying, coming into the show, man, that Eastern Division, we talked about at the end of the year. You said it at the front of the year. A lot of folks had their eyes glazing in the West and just had all this talk. You said, yeah, that deserves (laughs) to be some talk. But there's something about that Eastern Division that you felt really strong about. And as it played off in the second part of the year, the record spoke for itself in terms of the East against the West. Um, and you have to stick your chest out. I made sure people understood, but you said it. Um, and it looks like it's going to continue in that direction. You have a All-American, literally, quarterback coming back as a sophomore year that took the conference by storm, I would say, at Jackson State. You have a transfer coming to Alabama a and You have a transfer coming into Florida a and You have a transfer um, that came in the Mississippi Valley that has another year, and they're just getting stronger. Yeah. You have a, now a transfer at Alabama State. Um, wow. And we haven't even heard what Bethune Cookman, and I'm sure they quietly cooking up some things over there, too. Um as you think about it. So that East uh, is something that I can say off the top of my chest. I'm just I, I'm good. Y'all can have all that over there in the East. Have your own party. We'll see what the West can do when we get to a championship. Those crossover matchups are going to have a lot of determination of what's going to happen in the divisional race. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Bethune Cookman by former Jackson State quarterback Jalen Jones is over at Bethune Cookman now. So uh, he went um, left Jackson State, went JUCO. Now he's at Bethune Cookman now. But uh, we saw a little bit of what he could do uh, during his time under center at Jackson State. But you mentioned it. You talk about Alabama A and M uh, adding a transfer from University of Miami. You talk about FAMU adding a transfer in from uh, Vanderbilt, uh, Alabama State now with Demetrius Davis, Mississippi Valley getting stronger. Uh, the SWAC East is going to be a bloodbath from September 1 forward. So uh, it's going to be a fascinating season. Can't wait to get to the fall. And then uh, I'm not going to slight the West. I mean, Eric Dooley now at Southern. Uh, Texas Southern, there's a lot of excitement around Andrew Body over there at Texas Southern. Uh, Grandma, transfer quarterback coming in from UCLA. So this upcoming fall season, i tell you what, it's – this is going to be a lot of fun to sit back and watch a lot of these games. No doubt about it. Um, with that being said, let's go over to um, the sister conference, if you allow me to put it that way, in terms of the MEAC. Uh, looks like there may be some more churning. This is coming out of HBCU game day. They, they seem to put all this information to get ahead of these stories. They are suggesting, and my sources say the same thing, Howard University, and I've heard this back since January. It's my understanding it goes even further back than that. Howard University is prepping for conference change. It looks like the Colonial Athletic Association, the CAA, um, is becoming a de facto division with HBCUs in and of themselves. And what may be even more disturbing, it may not be done. Mm. But before we get to that, you got Howard University. Looks like they'll be moving to the Colonial Athletic Association in 2023, uh, 2024 season campaign. As you know, Howard would become the 14th full member of CAA. That would be July 1st, 2023. If they ratify it, and this is a goal, they will join Hampton University that uh, will become a member of the conference this July in all sports, including football. Um, the uh, CA football will expand to 15 members. Remember, a t is going over there as well. All their sports, except for football, will also start in 2022. Uh, football will stay in the Big South for another year. Bowling is still in the MEAC uh, for what that's worth. But Howard would be the third HBCU in the last four months to join the FCS Conference, Hampton University, North Carolina a and um, fascinating in terms of these stories. What are your thoughts on this, Troll? Well, I obviously, and just judging from the fan feedback, is what does this mean for the MEAC? Uh, you have another uh, member school that has left now. What does it mean for the future of the Celebration Bowl? So I think uh, there are a lot of questions that are in the air uh, now that you have Hampton, 
North Carolina A&T, and now Howard uh, that are joined the CAA. Uh, what does where 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 does the uh, MIAC go from here? I think that's what a lot of the fan feedback that I've seen uh, in regards to this move. Uh, like you said, it's been in the works for a second or two, but to actually uh, see more light being shed on it. Uh, apparently, uh, like I said, HBCU game day out in front of this uh, with Howard potentially moving to the CAA. Where does MIAC go from here? Um, this obviously at some point they expect. Expansion, but the weird thing is, it's not, not like everybody necessarily has somewhere to go. Obviously, you've heard the talk with Delaware State to the NEC. Um, Big South is training as well. So while it looks like maybe a open invitation, but if you're any of the MEAC schools, do you jump over to the Big South uh, with the concern that the CIA come back to the Big South or anybody else? Do some of the schools in the Big South go to Atlantic? I mean, Sun, uh, Atlantic Sun. Uh, you had a partnership with the OVC. What does that look like? Does the Colonial Athletic go to 16 schools um, in terms of football, or 14 in terms of all sports? So what does that mean? So I'm not sure if it's clear that the MEAC is going to be the conference that falls apart in terms of all these conferences, whether it's Sunday Atlantic, OVC, or the Big South. I think it's still uh, a position where you might see some things going uh, in that nature. And, and, and one of the questions that I know I had, Doc, was in regards to Howard, uh, North Carolina A&T going to the CAA. Uh, I know we questioned uh, that, that move to the Big South as being a lateral move, but this move to the Colonial Athletic Association, is that not lateral as well? It depends on what you look at it. In a lot of ways, it's lateral in terms of a conference that is one big league in basketball, uh, one big league in, uh, two big league in football. Um, in the past, they were extremely strong with James Madison, but obviously James Madison has moved up to FBS. Um, obviously, they're going to try to get stronger in basketball, but this is the conference that was getting multiple bids. They had George Mason, George Washington. Those yeah. teams that left went to Atlanta 10. So they're trying to rebuild themselves and try to get back to that. Um, so if you believe that can be done with this expansion model, then you would say, yeah, in that manner, uh, it can be a uh, benefit to you. But the question becomes that you don't really get to hear about, what are the distribution monies? Uh, what is the true distribution money uh, that currently the Colonial Athletic Association provides? What are they estimating that they can get to? What does that look like versus the MEAC before I can really give you a definitive answer of what this looks like? In terms of some academics, you can talk about the, the research side that there's some peer institutions that match up. Some of them are even research one versus research two, which all HBCUs that are research based are at the R2 level, uh, such as Howard, North Carolina AT, Jackson State, Texas Southern, Prairie View, and Southern just recently got R2 status. Uh, just to mention some of those fam, you make sure I don't leave them out, um, as well as Tennessee State for that matter. Uh, just to name most of them there. Clark Atlanta, people are surprised to hear about. They are R2 uh, institution uh, from that standpoint. So you can have that framing uh, that you're aligning yourself with some uh, research institutions, but you had that in the MEAC before uh, folks left. So I'm not sure how much you can talk about that. One thing that I looked at about um, that I said out there was the cultural uh, component it's associated with the move and what does that look like and mm -hmm. I was frankly um, straightforward to a lot of folks in terms of what I thought it meant in terms of moving from that perspective and I was looking for the notes I could literally read right off the notes so I wouldn't uh, come off of it I stated clearly out there that this uh, Great, this is a great deal of history and culture being dismantled. I've heard about it since January from inside sources that it was likely. Reminds me of a slow death of another black sporting institution, the Negro League, considering the height of the popularity 
or the Midwestern Athletic Association of the 1940s that went into the 1960s before it dissolved. So I suppose some will suggest that this is progress because unlike the Negro Leagues, now black institutions, HBCUs are included in a white institution, Colonial Athletic Association. I know for a lot of folks, uh, even African-Americans, black, it's, it's very difficult at times for them to look at stuff in that linear phase because they want to get beyond it. But this country has showed you continually that we're not beyond it. So I'll be frank about that and put that out there because I think it's important and you can't just ignore it and act like just because um, you don't want to see it that it doesn't exist. But the ability for D1 HBCU competitions in Atlantic Seaboard will decrease tremendously. And it will have devastating effects on the economic development of small African-American black businesses and community development in the area. So when you look at this more in terms of culture empowered and black institutions, you get a different uh, perspective of this. Um, and that's where we have fight, fought uh, with Dr. W.E. Du Bois would say along uh, back when he was writing about the double consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, when you had these two dichotomies that you were looking at in terms of lenses of the world. So if you look at this as a very individualistic, as an individual that you're gonna do what's best for yourself, uh, best for your individual family, best for your individual institution, becomes a lot easier to see yourself in saying, yeah, this makes sense versus looking at it in terms of collective empowerment. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of dichotomy that you see what a lot of folks have in these issues and confrontations out here uh, in terms of just having the dialogue. And um, we are wounded individuals, uh, people in terms of how we had to deal with this American experience. Um, and so it becomes challenging when somebody asks you to look at things empowering because every time you look around America, it's about self gratification, individual wealth, uh, individual accomplishment. So you're gonna ask me to do something in terms of a collective, but all these other folks are allowed to do it individually. It makes it a challenge. And so that's the dichotomy to me that you're looking at this lens in terms of that. And there's some other sporting type of uh, con strains that I put out there on Twitter that you can go and check out where I really get into uh, the framing of understanding this from a more sporting lens uh, that we may have uh, time to look at uh, beyond that. But let's take our first break. We'll come back. We have some other news to get into uh, that will be intriguing uh, about some news on the front. It might come back and just give a little more on this topic before we close it out. The stick with us, we'll be right back after this first break. For Marcus Sushi, really? No, wait, Troy, you work here? I'm never not working. Like head and shoulder scalp shield technology, up to 100% dandruff protection, even between washes. Never not working, huh? Oh, Troy, you're such a good teacher. Yeah, I know. <laughs> never not working. Never not working. Never ever not working. Are you serious? Never not working standard protection that's never not working head and shoulder scalp shield technology it's never too early to plant the seed to share the tradition and instill a sense of pride in your hbcu with your little ones hbcu pride and joy children's boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite hbcu visit hbcupridejoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. Are you hungry for authentic Caribbean food? Like jerk, chicken, oxtail, red snapper, shrimp, tofu, and rasta pasta? Well, find your way over to Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Pika in downtown Atlanta. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, open daily from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. And on Friday and Saturday, we're open till 4 a.m. Come to Mango's and put some spice in your life. So we've got a good Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Peacock. In downtown Atlanta. For more info or directions, call 404-698-3992. Or log on to mangoscaribbeanrestaurant.com. For instant coupons, text M-A-N-G-O-S to 313131. Tell your mama hungry, papa hungry, Caribbean Restaurant. Authentic Caribbean cuisine. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge. 
featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. That's www.slowburnwaco.com. Trust the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love yeah. and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir, yes, and pay attention to he. This is Dr. Ville inside HBC Sports Lab with Professor Bishop. Talking about Professor, mm. we held shop. <clears throat> we had the lectern going on. Shout out to BJ Jones. I see you, Arvin Parker. Appreciate you uh, joining us and, and giving a little shout out. You're right. We had a blast last night. Y'all had me up above the hours, but it was great talk. And people wanted to hear different conversations. But uh, good evening to the lab, you said. Shout out to BJ Jones for bringing on the spaces as we had a conversation with Howard uh, about the colonial athletic move and there were a lot of people on Howard that were bringing perspective. Uh, but we also had a chance to hold shop and give some uh, course lecture, if you would, last night. So a lot of people appreciated that, just giving some bracket drop in terms of the lose out there. Shout out to uh, Noel Price, Jerome Jeep Sutton, Anthony Johnson, John Jenkins, Jerome Sutton, as I said, Michael Ford, Thomas Maddox is in the house, Lonnie Shaw, Mary Allen, Troy Franklin, Karen Griffin. Shout out, shout out, shout out to all our lab listeners. We're deep in here today. Appreciate y'all. So mm. we'll get into maybe some marketing talk to provide some construct of how we can look all these things in culture and why this is important to us. But we'll look at it culture from a business lens and then we'll tie it back into social historical perspective. Uh, one thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit, and I'm sure a lot of people out here uh, were uh, intrigued about is the news about uh, SWAC is, has plans to file a lawsuit or has filed a lawsuit. Some people call it, call it a countersuit against Urban Edge Network regarding, regarding, I should say, involvement with the SWAC deal with PepsiCo from HBCU Game Day released this. Some of the things that are coming out of the release uh, was co a company is claiming that it has rights to broadcast athletic content within the SWAC has threatened to sue the league, claiming it interfered with a potential big time sponsor. An attorney presenting Urban Edge Network, parent company at HBCU League, has sent a notice to the SWAC on April 14th that it will be filing suit against conference documents obtained by HBCU uh, Game Day, alleges, quote, improper and illegal interference with UEN, expect a business transaction with PepsiCo. My understanding that the SWAC has itself planned to get a lawyer, and my understanding they already done it in terms of lawsuit action. And this is part of the statement that was taken from uh, SWAC Commissioner Dr. Charles McCullen, at least allegedly from the email according to HBCU Game Day. His correspondence read that went to the Council of Presidents that PepsiCo had reached out to him about Urban Edge broadcast SWAC. Now, that is important in the context that PepsiCo reached out to Charles, at least based on whichever way that you're going to look at this case potentially. But any entity that is approaching PepsiCo for media buys and referencing broadcasting SWAC games, not individual institutions that may have a deal with it, but SWAC games should be evaluated more closely. It has been brought to my attention that several entities have approached some of our corporate partners and other regarding media buys in the SWAC games. Just for your information, SWAC conference games cannot be streamed and broadcast on a national basis outside of a conference agreement. In addition, member institutions cannot grant permission to other entity broadcast games in either linear or digital on a national basis. All conference games are restricted and can only be negotiated by the conference office. A couple of things that I need to level set here to make sure you understand this. Part of this is about bylaw. There are SWAC bylaws that govern where you go in these positions. And let me see if I can give you a couple of bylaws just so you know uh, sections from the bylaws. That <laughs> yeah, this is specific. important. Yeah. 3.9 conference revenues. Any conference member who participates in a national, regional, or sectional bowl game in or television contest or meets weather during the regular preseason or postseason will share its part of the television revenue with the conference office or other members 
other conference. The above policy includes television. The participating conference institutions will retain 60% of the gross of forward balance, 40% to the conference office inclusion of the conference treasurer. All funds received by the Southwestern Athletic Conference becomes property of the conference and shall be administered in accordance with the SWAC Constitution and bylaws instruction from the Council of Presidents and Chancellors. There are also bylaws within the conference that all media rights, whether that is linear, right, or digital, or property of the Southwestern Athletic Conference. Second thing that is important for you all to know that that is just about the case for any conference in America. The lone conference that this was slightly different that many of you will be aware of is the Big 12, where they set up a conference, uh, television rights, where they allowed certain members of the conference to have, well, really anybody had the rights, so only three or four teams had the ability to use those rights. That's how Texas was able to get the Longhorn Network. Oklahoma had their own network. You had other ones in the conference, Kansas, TCU, that had digital networks. Uh, that were uh, to do that. The conference forgave those rights um, that they had, and they set up conferences rights like that where <clears throat> they had those rights. SEC, for example, or the Big Ten, the conference owns all those rights, right? And that's how they were negotiating. Now, the second part of this is important as well. When you talk about conference rights, you need to understand that there's various ways that you have conference rights and how those conference rights can be distributed based on broadcast networks. For example, you talk about ESPN. ESPN has a exclusionary deal. That was some of the first deals that ESPN did with all conferences were just about exclusionary deal. So it's not something that just the SWAC or the MEAC did. They're one of the few FCS conferences that were able to negotiate contracts with ESPN but ESPN was buying up all the rights. They were shelving a lot of rights so they wouldn't have competition. That's a side note. Just wanted to educate you on the process and what's going on out there. But besides the point there is the fact when you talk about the broadcasting rights, an exclusionary deal, that means they own everything. Mm. Good, bad, and different. I want you to understand that. If that's in the contract, you can go talk to the person who originally signed it. But that's the point exclusionary, hands off, you have nothing. They own all the rights. Now they can let you slide, and maybe let you have some of your personal individual local rights, but in terms of national rights and exclusionary deal, they own everything. Let's go to a different model, such as the SEC. SEC had what they call primary rights. They cut their rights up. Primary rights, if you go back and you're familiar with this and have watched SEC at any point on Saturday, CBS would have the game of the week. They signed a multi-million dollar deal to the SEC to get what they call primary rights. That means they had first choice. At one game, they got the pick from, they did it first. Then uh, SEC started understanding the game. They said, well, we're going to chop these rights up, similar to what they saw with the NFL, Major League Baseball, NBA. You have what you call your secondary rights. Secondary rights is after the primary gets their first rights. Now you have other inventory. You can sell it as secondary rights. Guess what? ESPN said they want it into action. We'll get your secondary rights. They actually bought secondary multiple rights. So that's how they were able to have two or three games. ESPN, ESPN2, ship some games maybe to ABC in terms of the night games from ESPN. You also have what you call tertiary rights. Yes, that's the third rights, and that's where tertiary comes from. Third rights is SEC, much like these other large conferences. Those third rights would go back to the school. School would sublease to maybe Raycom, if you remember those. Some of them would have their own digital networks. It, they found out there was value. They put all those rights back together, bought rights back from Raycom, let some terminate at the end of the contract. SEC commissioner said, hey, this is value. They went back to ESPN and said, do you want to negotiate on getting all these rights? ESPN couldn't wait. ESPN said, yes. In fact, we'll create an SEC network. 51% of that went to ESPN, 49% bought out by a subsidiary. 
That's one way to do your rights. Another example is the Big Ten. They have a deal where they had the Big Ten Network. After their first rights are gone, primary rights, they got the secondary rights. Then they created tertiary rights, brought all the rights back from the institution, sold it out, went to Fox. And they have a deal with 50-some percent of their rights go to Fox Sports. Then the other part, they put together and they own a percentage of the rights. That's how you get some of these multi-million dollar deals. So it's important to understand contextually the different frameworks of rights. So as an institution, you don't automatically have the ability to have your rights. And this is not different. Again, I want people to understand this is not just unique to the SWAT. Because sometimes people will automatically assume because it's a black institution, as I talked about in the first segment, that these folks know what they're doing. Oftentimes, this is just the lay of the land and the way it works in terms of business. You're saying it's standard practice. Standard practice. Okay. Standard practice. Let me say it again. The last thing I will say is important when you look at the construct of this deal, though, one of the issues in terms of the lawsuit is simply the fact that an organization doesn't have the ability to come in and have, buy a institutional's rights that are local rights and then distribute them nationally and saying that we are having a network on a local level. That's circumventing the rules. It doesn't work like that. And don't get mad at the SWAC. The SWAC previous commissioner signed an exclusive deal. Who do you think that big entity is going to come after for a national deal? Not only are they going to come after said company that negotiated, they're going to come after the institution, and they're going to come after the conference. They don't care. They signed an agreement. If y'all don't understand the agreement, that's y'all business. And you think they're just going to sit back and say, y'all do what y'all want to do? No, they're going to come eat. This is America. This is what you want to be a part of, capitalism, corporate. This is what you said you want, big time business. So don't get scared now because it's at your doorstep. You better <laughs> learn it and understand it and get mm. in the game as fans and appreciate it. So closing on that, just wanted you to understand a little bit about the business of television rights, how you break them down, who owns them, who has the ability of it. And you need to understand bylaws, the fine framework of the contract before you jump out of here and say one party is right and one party is not. Just wanted to level set it back. This is Dr. Bill inside the HBC Sports Lab. We'll take a break. Charles, come back. Maybe wants to get in some details and we can break that down. We'll see if some mm -hmm. people ha may have some questions uh, out here in terms of the show, and we'll see if we can get you some answers to your questions the best of my ability. We'll truly have class and lecture today. Let's go back and we'll get back to you right after this break. Charmin Ultra Soft has so much cushiony softness, it's hard for your family to remember. They can use less. Sweet pillows of softness. This is soft. Holy Charmin. Oh, excuse me. Roll it back, everybody. Sorry. Charmin Ultra Soft is so cushiony soft, you'll want more. But it's so absorbent, you can use less. So it's always worth it. Now, what did we learn about using less? You gotta roll everybody <laughs> we all go why not enjoy the go with Charmin Q time is our classic Atlanta soul food restaurant located in the historic West End Q time soul food is a family business started by Fred and Christine Crenshaw come on in relax and sink your chops into our tantalizing mouth-watering distinctive soul food with a twist the Q time way 1120 Ralph David Abernathy Boulevard or call your order in at 404-758-2881 do you miss your mama's cooking? Then come on down to Q Time, an Urban Passport member. For 200 years, Montgomery, Alabama has been making history by people who had the courage to stand up for change. Today, this riverfront city has been reborn, embracing the past and looking forward to the future. From the National Memorial for Peace and Justice to the stage of the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, this is where history was and is made. We are proud to call Montgomery home. And together, we can be the change. The top HBCU programs in the nation come to Montgomery, Alabama's Riverwalk Stadium this May 11th through 
14th for the Black College World Series. The best black college baseball teams in the NCAA Division II and the NAIA will battle for black baseball's ultimate pride. Games will be streamed live at www.mybcsn.net. Tickets are available now online at www.blackcollegechampionships.com. That spin class was brutal. Well, you can try using the Buick's massaging seat. Ooh, yeah, that's nice. Can I use Apple CarPlay to put some music on? Sure, it's wireless. Pick something we all like. Okay, hold on. What's your Buick's Wi-Fi password? Buick Envision 2021. Oh, you should pick something stronger that's really predictable. That's a really tight spot. Don't worry, I used to hate parallel parking. Me too. Hey. You really outdid yourself. Yes, we did. The all-new Buick Envision, an SUV built around you, all of you. From novice to aficionado, to find yourself. With your hip -hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, Boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. This is Dr. Bill inside the HBC Sports Lab with Charles Bishop. Charles, I think you had a question before we get too far into the next subject. Yeah, and, you know, this is a question from a student to, to a professor here in class, but uh, the million-dollar question I want to ask is if it is baked into the bylaws that uh, individual institution cannot negotiate on the behalf of the conference, why would not the university's general counsel not have an understanding that of that before they got into some negotiation uh, on the behalf of the uh, of the institution uh, and the conference as well, I, I, I don't I don't understand that. I don't I don't get how that happens. Yeah. How that oversight happens? It, it can happen simply from the fact that everybody's not talking to each other, um, and that's one of the things when you have conferences. It's really important to make sure that everybody talks. But one of the best practices that you can have uh, to help solve a lot of this is every general counsel of a conference institution should have the bylaws of that conference. And that's no difference with the Southwest Athletic Conference or the MEAC Conference. Every general counsel, as well as every AD, VP of uh, athletics, should have a copy of the conference bylaws. I'm almost sure all of the uh, athletic directors do, but they should share that um, and leave a copy with the general counsel of their institution. Or, as Charles alluded to in this, uh, which I certainly agree with, uh, Dr. Clinton uh, expressed concern that the issue could jeopardize the least relationship with Mexico, uh, the relationship, for that matter, with ESPN, who think is renegotiating with potential eight-figure payment. He stated it poised a potential bigger threat to the league's negotiation with Byron Allen's media group for the secondary broadcast rights. The email uh, states that the total funding jeopardizes could potentially be in excess of a million dollars. So this is not chump change. This is significant. And one thing that I always talk about when we let off with the first 15 minutes is about understanding individual institutions and the collective power. Where people get um, construed on this is thinking that their individual institution is larger or better than the sum of the parts. Now, mm. that's fun in terms of banner, in terms of games, going back and forth. But if you're serious about sports and serious about uh, understanding how you're going to climb up the sporting mountain top, is you need to understand the importance of collective empowerment. One of the reasons you have conferences is to create the partnership among the institutions because it's stronger as a collective than it is as an individual. Again, one of the reasons the SEC is so strong not just because they happen to have, quote unquote, these great institutions. It's because they understand how to come together collectively. And the strongest institutions bring up what you would call the lesser institutions. Same thing with the Big Ten and why they tend to be so strong. And I'm talking about directly related to what they're able to do in their television rights and how they brought the sum of those parts together to go to the table to collect the the negotiate their group wealth. And all they do is distribute that wealth back to the institutions. So if you understand the collective framework, you do well. Or you can look at the Big 12 model, 
when you have a couple of schools um, that are strong and say we're the big dogs and they collectively can be strong, right? But the other ones are not as strong. But if you're not careful, what ends up happening in those situations is that the collective network of them playing each other is devalued. So it ultimately hurts the stronger institution. It's the same reason that the NFL depresses value of athletes, which I can't stand, for the benefit of the wealthy CEOs and executives by putting a cap in there to depress the ability of certain institutions to be so much better than other institutions just because they have a bigger media market. Mm. It's the business of sports. It's just how it's done. And if you take the time to look at it, you can decipher it and you can use that for the benefit of growing your conference and therefore your institution. That's what I've always tried to get across. So from a cultural perspective, and like you mentioned, uh, we banter quite a bit, rough and swag, 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 whatever the case might be, uh, whatever your fan boards are. In some ways, does that pride within your institution, uh, does it undercut understanding the collective empowerment of sports business? No doubt. If you get to the point that you are deteriorating the other brand that's a part of your conference, you're deteriorating the conference, which means by default, you're deteriorating yourself. So yes, there, there should be the natural inclination of competition. Mm. That's what sports is about. But when it starts to go beyond that, all you're doing is costing yourself money. Um, and so that's of your own detriment uh, in terms of understanding that. And it goes to the strength of your conference, which gives us a chance to go into a little bit of this uh, baseball talk in terms of what took place this weekend. And you know I'm not going to ignore this. When you had Prairie View A&M uh, Panthers sweep Southern that came into uh, the West as the top dog, as they should be, um, but Prairie View swept them, which put Southern to third coming into the second half of the season. Last week closed the first half of those five games uh, of five matches with the conference. People in their division, 15 games essentially, uh, is intriguing in terms of what this second half should line up to be and should be really exciting to follow, both in baseball and softball for that much. But Prairie View, after the sweep, sweep of Southern, are 11 and 4. Bramley State is 10 and 5. Southern is 9 and 6. Texas Southern is 7 and 8. Arkansas Pine Bluff 5 and 8. And Alcorn State is 2 and 12. Fascinating here in terms of where these teams sit. The poll for Black College Nines uh, will debut this week. And so we should have it for you on Thursday. It's fascinating to see where Southern. Alabama State and Prairie View will be probably in the top of their conference. Who will get the nod for, uh, for first place? Alabama State, speaking of them, is in the East leading that division with a conference record of 12 and 2, 21 and 14 overall. Bethune Cookman at 10 and 5, tied with FAMU at 10 and 5, Jackson State 6 and 9, as they bats are starting to get right. Mississippi Valley State uh, 3 and 10, Alabama A and 3 and 12 in terms of what's going on there in the play there. Alabama State has won six in a row. Prairie has won four in a row, including some non-conference games last week, which was big in terms of what that looks like. Fascinating in terms of what's going on there. Um, talk about a little baseball in the MEAC. Uh, tight at the top, you did start to maybe get a little separation in terms of the bottom team, but at the top, you still teams right there. Delaware State at 11-9, Cotton State at 11-9, Maryland East Shore at 10-10, and Norfolk State at 8-12. and So, you know, you got that three-game lead. Uh, instead of just the two-game lead we seen last week. And so it looks like uh, Delaware State, Cotton State, Maryland, Eastern Shore, right there. Norfolk State is not too far behind uh, in terms of what that looks like. Softball top teams in each division, but throwing Cookman 12-6, and six, starting to see if they're running away with some things. Jackson State at 9-7, and seven, FAMU at 10-8. and eight. They give you the top three teams there uh, in the West. Texas Southern at 15-3. Pushing away with that, Prairie View at 11 and 7, all going to stay at 8 and 7, all throwing Southern with eight wins as well, but 10 losses in terms of what's going on in that division. Should be fascinating and things that go forward. Softball, 
uh, for the MIAC, Norfolk State at 12 and 3. Tied with Morgan State, also at 12 and 3. Howard is right there. One less win, but they only have three losses at 11 and 3. Uh, Maryland Eastern Shore, uh, top half of the conference, closes out at 10 and 5. But Maryland Eastern Shore has lost five straight games after they were getting it done uh, the first of the year. Norfolk State is the hottest team with 11 straight wins, if you would, looking good. Fascinating because you have some key matchups uh, with some crossovers that I, I'm, I'm curious about this week that uh, should be played in terms of today. You have North Carolina Central and North Carolina a and I'm intrigued about that matchup. You mm. have Hampton and Norfolk State in terms of some games to keep your eyes on in terms of the key matchups. And then you have a MEAC swag matchup with South Carolina State and Alabama State in softball. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. That Tuesday matchup will be Alabama State and South Carolina State. Um, looks like it will be canceled. I hate to hear that, but North Carolina AT and North Carolina Central, they be also postponed. So you have some key matchups that would have been fascinating to be played, but you do look like you're going to get your Norfolk State in Hampton uh, before you get back into the weekend with some of these conference races, which we'll talk a little more on Thursday. But excited about that. In terms of baseball, softball, what's on your mind in terms of the matchups uh, going on there? A uh, huge weekend, Purdue. Uh, that was a huge sweep of Southern. Uh, interesting because uh, they they switched that game from Baton Rouge to uh, Prairie View, uh, and because of, of, of the potential inclement weather. But now that series uh, toward the in May will be in Baton Rouge. So it'll be fascinating to see what Southern and Prairie View, where they are by the time they come to that uh, weekend finale series. Uh, but kudos to Prairie View for getting a sweep uh, over uh, Southern. Uh, kudos to Jackson State. They're fighting back in there. Their bats have gotten hot. They took two or three from Florida AM. and uh, Huge oh, weekend dude. series. Huge weekend series, Alabama State. They come to Jackson State this weekend. So uh, Jackson State will need to make a little bit of hay uh, for that weekend series. And then they also have... Bethune Cookman uh, that'll be coming to Jackson a little bit later on uh, in the in the season. So uh, Jackson State needs to make up a little bit of ground there. Uh, currently, you know, uh, they've won their past two series now, uh, which is huge, I think, for their confidence level going into this weekend. So uh, some fascinating baseball play. And I don't want to overlook Grammar sitting right there at 10 and 5. They're playing some phenomenal baseball. So uh, they should, I think they have all corn this weekend at home uh, in Grammar. They should be able to take care of business. Uh, this weekend. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see what's going on this weekend with regards to a lot of swag races. No doubt about it. This is Dr. Bill inside HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Mike is out on assignment. So we're sitting here going back and forth with Charles. Let's take this last break. We'll get back and come in with some more lecture. We'll talk about a little bit of sports marketing, the elevator to give you some context about how all this fits together from a marketing perspective. So we're really going to make this a show that you get a chance to get some of that uh, information that we do in terms of our classes on the sport management side. So stick with us, check us out. We'll make sure that you get all the information you need, not just about HBCUs, but the business of sport. You get it right here on Dr. Mills Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this last break. We get into the seventh inning stretch. From novice to aficionado, Find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service with Slowburn. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. Slowburn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. It's more than a mobile lounge, it's an environment and an experience rich in history, luxury, and personality. An elegant extension of any celebration occasion. It's the perfect escape and meeting place. A space where you can relax or enjoy a shared passion. Have Slowburn plan your next big event or before you are planning to celebrate your win over your athletic rival, you can shop our collections at www.slowburnwaco.com. But if they won, she tap. Uh, I'm going to do the dab, yeah. Nope. Nope. Come on, him. Ooh, I like him. Quick 
the quicker picker upper bounty picks up messes quicker and each sheet is two times more absorbent so you can use less he's an eighth he's a nine bounty the quicker picker upper it's never too early to plant the seed to share the tradition and instill a sense of pride in your hbcu with your little ones hbcu pride and joy children's boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCUPrideJoy on Facebook and Twitter. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love that and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir yes, and pay attention because he gonna teach a lesson. This is Dr. Bill inside HBC Sports Lab. Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Mike Washington is out on assignment, so we're bringing it to you with Charles Bishop, the professor. Professor Bishop, you got some golf news you want to share out? You know you, the golf aficionado on the show here. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, Slack, uh, golf championship being played in Jackson at the Refuge. Of course, that is a, a nice track. If you've ever played Refuge, uh, you got to play some shots out there. You got to move the ball around a little bit. But Texas Southern, they are currently up on Alabama State by 20 strokes. Uh, they are uh, going into uh, day three uh, up 20 strokes, plus 43 to Alabama State's plus 63. So that's on the women's side of, of, of the ledger. On the men's side, it's Texas Southern and uh, Arkansas Pine Bluff fighting it out as uh, Texas Southern is currently four strokes up on Arkansas Pine Bluff. So uh, day three promises to be uh, really interesting, definitely uh, on the women's and men's side. Uh, 20 stroke lead, you know, uh, it takes one or two players to kind of get hot and kind of eat that up a little bit, but it, it can happen, especially uh, when you're talking about a couple of pedigree programs in Texas Southern and Alabama State. They'll be fighting it out. Should be a fun one with Texas Southern and Arkansas uh, Pine Bluff as well. Four strokes, it can go any way. But uh, the refuge, I mean, it is a big track, almost 7,000 yards for the men. Uh, those greens are big and fast. Uh, you got to play some breaks out there. And like I said, you got to maneuver the ball around a little bit. Uh, you got to play some shots. So it'll be a, a stern test uh, for the SWAC championship tomorrow. It'll be fascinating. Talking about championships, let's go to the CIAA. Livingston Capitals the 2022 CIAA Golf Championship. Blue Bears, Joel, Dallas uh, Lane uh, got it done in terms of the visual title. Livingston College maintained their position atop the leaderboard to claim the 2022 CIAA Golf Championship that was in Dunn, North Carolina at the Shakur Golf Club. Uh, Blue Bears finished with a score of 582 plus 14 to capture their first title since 2018 uh, to get it done, to give you some indication there. I want to go back to talk a little bit about marketing to give you some concepts of marketing uh, because we're talking about these fans and you brought up you know, you know, where we are as fandom and how do we look at fandom? Well, I'm going to give you some textbook definition of what this looks like. And you've talked about this uh, in terms of teaching some of the sport marketing classes in some ways. So you're familiar with these concepts, but I thought I would share it with everybody. Um, we'll put on the drop and give you a picture of what this looks like, but it's just what we call the sports marketing escalator. The sports marketing escalator is a concept about introducing new fans onto the escalator and moving current fans up the escalator. So if you imagine yourself going up the escalator, if you're not on the escalator, that's where your fandom is. That means you're detached. You have no real interest into a game. But you can move up this escalator. As you move up the escalator, your fandom in terms of what like that looks like is important. So you go from a non-consumer, not even on the escalator if you want, to imagine that to an indirect consumer. And when we talk about consumers, we're talking about fans in the context of uh, sport marketing uh, for a conference, for example. As you go up this escalator to a consumer, you have what you call light consumers. Those were folks that maybe just come to a football game for homecoming or when their cousin is playing on the team, right? Those are what you we call light users. Um, they might go to a game here and there because um, they like the visiting team, and it's a big rivalry game, so they come to that. Uh, then you have what you call your medium users. They might be the type of fans that you think about if you had 
uh, season tickets and you bought a, a book of tickets for like, instead of all five home games, you might just buy two home games. So three home games. You talking about basketball, instead of having all 10, 11 games, you might have a package where you buy three home games for certain matchups. You might like the fact when uh, Prairie View uh, comes to town, if you're Texas Southern, you might want to be at the game when Southern comes down or Grambling. Or you might just do like Saturday games because you can't make, because of your business schedule, work schedule, you can't do Monday games. So those are what you call medium fans. And you have your heavy youth. Those are the folks that follow us oftentimes in terms of all these social media platforms. They are totally engaged in growth. Um, we're all the type of paraphernalia in terms of uh, their their team, or even you could say this in terms of fraternity or sorority, right? Um, they go to uh, multiple games. They tend to be the ones that buy season tickets, right? And so those are your heavy users. Well, what's unique about marketing when you think about these concepts is depending on where your fandom is, is how you're going to market to them. So if you're creating a true marketing portfolio of your fans, you can't just do one marketing framework because your fans, consumers are at different levels. So each one of them touch points are going to be different. So that's why it's so important. This is where we get into what you call consumption. So depending on sports fans' consumption to one of the institutions or their intersection of the consumption associated with multiple sports programs or even the conference or conference would directly impact your psychological consumption of these decisions. So that's why you may want to argue that the SWAC has this great interest of SWAC sports, maybe less so than what you compare with the MEAC based on that sports consumption of the fan itself. Last thing we'll get in here to kind of touch on uh, that we touched on last night um, in that mixer that a lot of people are talking about in terms of spaces on Twitter, led by DJ Jones and the others. Uh, in addition, there's what you call a social historical component that we often ignore because for many it is painful. I touched on this at the beginning of the show. The social historic concepts involve social history, a combination of social and historical factors. This is the only for those that ask for the framing of case study analysis of trying to really dissect what is going on in terms of the SWAC at this time. In a lot of ways, what you find out when you look at the SWAC, you start to naturally get these interests uh, where you oftentimes have to deal with lawsuits or deal with multiple folks because now they believe that this is where the money is, that there is such a huge interest in the SWAC. Mm. That's where you get a lot of interest going on and why these things start to happen. So all is not lost when these things are happening. They're not the best thing, but they do show you that there's a level of consumption uh, that is there. It is also where you see a lot of folks having engaged and having different frameworks of what we're hearing about the move of North Carolina a and the previous move to Hampton, whether that was to the Big South, now to the Colonial Athletic Association, or what we're hearing uh, likely is the move by Howard. And that's where you get that anxiety of what does this mean for my fandom, my fan consumption. And so a lot of people don't understand that you can directly trace money associated with your program with fan consumption and the escalator. The higher you have folks on there, the more likely they're going to give, whether that is to the um, foundation, uh, to the games themselves, Mm. Uh, to the sport marketing group, the Alumni Foundation, it's based on engaging your fans with sports marketing, understanding fan consumption, and then finally taking uh, utilizing that from a historical social connection in terms of that. That is the framework of how I would put the case study together mm. and have it in a class for my students <laughs> to analyze specifically that is unique to Texas Southern University because we do it on HBCU sports. So mm -hmm. that was unique about what we do. Go ahead, Professor Bishop. What did you want to add to that? So curious what that fan consumption looks like now for Hampton, North Carolina, a and and now Howard moving to the CAA. I think that is a interest, going to be a very interesting case study analysis in terms of what cultural aspects do you keep, or, or, or is it even possible uh, with this move to the CAA? So. Yeah, I think there is some that you can keep because you have your individual 
individual HBCU, and I don't want to ignore that. Um, there is the natural consumption that goes together when two HBCUs play, but you have your individual consumption of HBCU in itself that is extremely important. And depending on the history of the school, where fans are attached to that, it can vary from institution to institution. It's also important uh, when you look at it from the fact that the Colonial is going to have the benefit of having three HBCUs in that conference, if not more, uh, which is going to allow the natural conferences uh, to churn within there from conference competitive competition. And then you do have your non-conference games that will help there. Uh, but in a lot of ways, it's really going to depend. We cannot leave out the factor, though, um, in terms of winning percentage, mm. um, which is something I think is fascinating. So if a and can win like they did not do in the Big South, but like they did in terms of track, you still have fans that are following track and field and following how talented this track program is. So the fandom associated with that is very high. You see athletes all over the world will let you know about their big-time track program, which they should. But you don't hear as much about the football team that do, do well. You didn't hear much about the baseball team that just has one conference win. You don't hear much about the basketball team, men's or women's, because they're not as successful. So there has to be the ability of a and Hampton, for that matter, that's been in the Big South a couple of years that you haven't heard much about because they just haven't been able to turn out wins other than uh, two years ago before a and got there that they won in track. Um, and so you'll see that in terms of Howard, even Howard and the MEAC. Um, they haven't been able to turn out a lot of excitement. And people will talk about the regionality, which is so true that they're in a pro sports town. You see that a little bit with Texas Southern. But Texas Southern wins in basketball. What do you see at basketball home games? They turn out. Even though it's in Houston, they have significant fan base, even to compare with teams that are not having to deal with uh, a pro sports marketing. So we can't isolate these things. We have to look at both your ability to understand your partnership with your fans, your consumption, your history, the type of program you had over the years, and what are you doing for me lately? Where are you in the marketplace in terms of winning? So it's important to put all those things together. So I appreciate that question because contextually it's important that you cannot just look at this isolated, but you also got to make sure that you um, calculate in, are you going to be able to win? And it'll be interesting because the cost of winning in the Colonial Athletic Association is significant higher than it was in the Big South and even more so than the MEAC. So it's going to cost you more. Uh, to win in that league, uh, which will be interesting to follow to make sure that they can do that. So these are the things that I talk about when you make a decision when I said, what is the data speaking to? So people get emotional and want to talk about, um, you know, this is a feel good. Uh, we're talking about this, whatever. Yes, all those things are important. The cost of travel, uh, localization, but there's a give and take with that. When you talk about localizing, uh, like Tennessee State and OVC in terms of all those regional, it's hard to become a national brand like they were during the 40s, 50s, and 60s when they were playing anybody anywhere and played a larger footprint of HBCUs and some historically white colleges when they could play them outside of the region before they had to deal with uh, the segregated South then what you are now when you're localizing and very regional small, that means that people outside of that area do not see you. And, and then it doubles down when you're not able to win over 30 years. Mm. It really depresses the value of your organization, no matter what your history is. But now the counter to that is because you do have a steep history, if you can start turning the coin win, you can build it up relatively quickly, sure. um, if you would, over a period of time. So that goes multiple ways. But I do want to make sure people get a bigger picture of what that looks like. Um, you've seen that right there with Prairie View to give you a, a program in the SWAC. It had the 80-game losing streak and how challenging it was to come out of that hole. But once they started winning, you saw the significance of the fan base and what they do in terms of Dallas at the State Fair Classic, selling four to one tickets uh, compared to Gramlin. This is data now. This is not what I'm making up. This is what you can see if you go get those documents to show you the value of the institution when they make the commitment uh, to athletics, which Prairie View does now being one of the top four 
programs in terms of their athletic. And you can see consistently how they win more than not. So the things that all play together in terms of understanding uh, the business of sports from some of the terms that I use in terms of sports consumption, understand the sports marketing escalator. So we'll leave it right there. I think that's enough for uh, the folks out there. hope you enjoyed got a better understanding of the business side of sports. People were asking for this, so I wanted to take the time and mix it in uh, to the show appropriately. So hopefully it fit with the news of the day and gave you some updates of what's going on. So we'll close right there. This is Dr. Ville inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington Charles Bishop. Thank you for listening to Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Yannicka Caville, the Dean of HBCU Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBCU Sports with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Again, we thank you for listening to Dr. Gaville's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and Thursday. We'll be back Thursday. We'll get into some of these big-time games this weekend at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time. We look forward to, uh, to you listening on Thursday. We'll discuss the latest news in the lab. Follow me, Dr. Yada Caville, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Shout out to Stephen Gaither with all the breaking news he's getting out there, HBC game day. He was part of that space and discussion with DJ Jones. Wanted to shout him out. Charles, go ahead. Shout out to my daughter, Clark Bishop. Happy 18th birthday. Oh, big time. <laughs> Happy birthday, Clark. Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1. That's on Twitter. Facebook and YouTube. Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Dream big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Charles? Of course. Roy? Lecture. Dismissed. <laughs>